Thanks. <coughs> my, my task today is to discuss uh, the mm, potential uh, complications of the renal and ureteral system in patients with a digestive disease. Just to start from the very beginning, uh, this is an anatomy picture of uh, the kidneys. The kidneys are receive the blood from the renal arteries, and the renal arteries originate from the aorta, which is the largest artery that we have in our body. And you, you can see here, this is the aorta, and this is the big location in the two common iliac arteries. The blood goes to the kidneys, it is filtered in the kidneys, and then returns through the veins, and these are the two renal veins that, that uh, then take the blood to the inferior vena cava. The blood is filtered through the kidneys and it becomes urine, and the urine is collected by the urinary system uh, made of the renal pelvis and the ureters, and the, the ureters are these two tubes that you can see here, and that they uh, take the urine to the bladder. If you make a, um, if you make a cut, uh, which is called an axial uh, view in in, uh, in imaging studies, and this is the anterior part of your abdomen, and this is your spine. This part here is called retroperitoneum, and I, I want to clarify what the retroperitoneum is because we all often talk about retroperitoneal fibrosis or retroperitoneal infiltration in patients with ECD. The retroperitoneum is that uh, anatomical part of the abdomen which is just behind the peritoneum and, it, uh, and where the kidneys and other structures are located, uh, the kidneys as you can see here, the inferior vena cava, the aorta, and the arteries and veins that go from the, old, from the aorta into the inferior vena cava. And this is where, and we yet do not know why, this is where ECD uh, mainly affects the abdomen. The, the infiltration can be also um, extended to involve the, the, the gut itself, but most of the problems arise when, when the disease is located in this area. Now, just to move from anatomy to, to from a, 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 a picture like this to what is a CT scan, what is computer tomography. This is a computer tomography scan in a patient, in a, sorry, in a healthy subject. This is without contrast medium, and this is after contrast medium. The contrast medium is injected intravenously, goes in, into the circulation and is filtered by the kidneys, and this is why you see that the structures that, that are gray in this image without contrast medium become white in this after contrast medium. But contrast medium has many other functions in, in, uh, in imaging studies. But this is just to highlight where the, where the problems arise. This is, again, the retroperitoneum, and this is where the infiltration by foamy histocytes and all the inflammatory infiltration that accompanies uh, histocytic infiltration takes place. Again, this is the abdominal CT scan in a healthy subject, in a healthy subject and this is what happens in uh, patients <coughs> with ECD. As you can see here, the, the normal profile of the kidneys is totally changed and there is this infiltration around the kidneys that uh, affects the whole kidney, the adrenal gland, which is above the kidney, and uh, because of, it, of its irregularity, uh, it, this image is usually called hairy kidneys. The problem is that this infiltration is not only around the kidney, but it also affects the arteries and veins that go to the kidney and also the proximal part of the ureter. So the ureter often becomes obstructed, and this is a, what, what happens in the kidneys, because the, the gray part, the darker part you can see within the kidney is uh, urine that cannot be eliminated. So the problem is what we call obstructive uropathy. So it's compression of the ureters which causes uh, renal disease. This is again another view using a, 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 a computer tomography scan. We can see here the, the healthy subject and here again what happens in patients with ECD. These are the kidneys and as you can see there's this tissue around the kidneys 
bilaterally and the collection of urine within the kidney. So if the kidney is, is obstructed, of course, uh, its function is affected most of the time. Perirenal infiltration affects approximately 50 to 70 percent of patients with ECD. In our series, we have a percentage of patients of uh, 62 percent, which is uh, in line with other studies. So this is one of the most common manifestations of the disease. The infiltration is often limited to the perirenal space, but it also extends to the renal helium, so where the renal artery and vein are, the renal pelvis and the proximal ureter. The, the presence of this tissue around the kidney may limit the ability of the kidney to dilate when the ureters are, are compressed. So sometimes we may fail to see uh, hydronephrosis, but the kidney is, is still, is still uh, obstructed. And we, uh, we also need to remember that this part here is a very good site for biopsy. This is a very easy way to get tissue, and this is a very good diagnostic tissue. In most hands, uh, we found that uh, perirenal biopsies are often diagnostic, they yield a good quantity of DNA for the analysis of mutations and so on. And this is just an example of a, of a biopsy that we made, a percutaneous biopsy, so you don't need surgery, you just place a needle here, and this is what comes out. And as you can see here, this is, these are structures of the kidney, this is a glomerulus, this is the kidney capsule, and this is the pathological infiltration around the kidney. Uh, a common question that patients uh, ask us uh, is what kind of study do I have to do to image my kidneys and ureters? Which is the best one? So these are the main studies that we uh, use uh, in clinical practice in imaging the abdomen. We use sonography, computer tomography, MRI, PET, used, usually, usually combined with CT, so it's called PET-CT, and urography. There are pros and cons for each of them. I would say that, just to, to, to briefly summarize, um, that sonography is used, useful only to detect hydronephrosis. It is surely a non-invasive method, there is no radiation, but the, the visualization of the perirenal and periureter tissue is very poor. It is of limited usefulness for follow-up, especially to understand whether this tissue shrinks or not. Computer tomography is a very good imaging modality for the diagnosis and for the follow-up. The disadvantage is that it involves radiation, it has potential nephrotoxicity, and it's contraindicated if you have allergy to uh, the contrast medium. Uh, and it, but it's, it's a good exam because you, you can take your CD and go to another specialist and have it uh, reviewed, whereas sonography is very much dependent on, on the operator. MRI has most of the advantages of uh, computer tomography and another advantage of a CT is that it doesn't involve radiation. One very much used technique is nowadays PET-CT, but we need to understand that PET-CT is a, is a totally different um, imaging technique because PET-CT um, looks at how this tissue is active, but does not give us a, a, very nice, uh, visual, a very nice assessment of the morphology of the lesion. And also in terms of, of uh, evolution and size of the lesion, it is very poor in, in terms of you know, understanding if this lesion has shrinked or has enlarged. And finally, we have uh, urography, which we can perform uh, as a retrograde, so placement of a, uh, of, a, of a catheter, injection of contrast medium in the bladder, and then we can visualize the ureters, and we can guide the, the, the placement of uh, nephrostomy tubes, or uh, especially stents. So when, when this tissue that is around the kidneys extends to involve the proximal part of the ureters, as you can see here, this patient has only a very, very mild disease around the kidneys. But still, here we see that there is a, a, a very important hydronephrosis. Hydronephrosis, which is the result of obstruction, occurs in about 20 to 50% of patients. 
it may be unilateral, but it often uh, becomes bilateral. It is usually in cities on set. Uh, it, is, it can be asymptomatic. We have patients that have had hydronephrosis for months or sometimes for years without any significant symptom. And the stenosis is usually of the upper part of the ureter, uh, unlike uh, what happens in, uh, in another disease, which is called idiopathic racial peritoneal fibrosis, which is often differential diagnosis with ECD. And this usually involves the, the second part, so the middle part of the lower part of the ureter. What can we do to relieve obstruction? This is usually what we do to be non-invasive. We usually put a stent. A stent is a tube that has two extremities, which are, it's called usually double J, because of the, of the morphology of this extremity. And it locks the stent in the renal pelvis and in the bladder. So the stent allows uh, the, the urine to bypass any kind of blockage, and of course, uh, it can be placed by via cystoscopy. It has a limited duration, so stents usually last for six months to 12 months, and they need to be changed because they can become infected, they can become obstructed, calcified, and so on. Unfortunately, stents are very uh, poorly tolerated by some patients. Uh, the complications include irritation, especially in the bladder, lower urinary tract symptoms, which include frequency, uh, which include uh, uh, urgency sometimes. There can be infections, because foreign bodies are usually the site for infections, and there can be bleeding. But this is usually a good system to allow an internal renal drainage, and we don't have external tubes. This is what happens in ECD. ECD infiltrates the kidney, all around the kidney and the proximal part of the ureter. And here is the site where we usually have a stricture by ECD. And the problem is that sometimes, even if we put a stent, even if we use an effective therapy for, uh, to induce the shrinkage of this tissue, hydronephrosis persists. So sometimes we need to use a different type of stent, <coughs> different type of stent, which are called tumor stents. And these stents are called tumor stents because they are used to relieve obstructions which are caused by uh, malignant disease. True malignant diseases <coughs> usually cause very, very tight obstructions, very severe obstructions, and in that case, we need to have a stronger stent. So these stents are again placed by cystoscopy. They have a duration of about 12 months, and they have a reinforced internal layer and the, the, the segment that is reinforced depends on the size of the obstruction. If you cut the stent, you can see that there is an internal part which is very rigid and an external part which uh, adapts to the, to the ureter and is a softer part. So these are used more and more nowadays. And I think we have a few patients um, that have been treated using these kinds of stents and they, they kind of work well. If the stents are not uh, easily uh, placeable, if the obstruction is very severe, sometimes we also use nephrostomy. Nephrostomy is a, implies that you have a, an external tube, so the, the quality of life is really much, uh, it, it is really uh, affected by this kind of device. But we have to say in our experience that um, nephrostomy tubes usually drain the kidneys very well. So if you have a, a kidney that is not uh, drained enough by a urethral stent, then in that case, a nephrostomy tube is an option. This is how nephrostomy appears in a, in a CT scan. As you can see here, the tube goes through the skin and then it arrives within the kidney. But the problem is that we, we have an obstruction and we can put a stent, we can put a nephrostomy tube, but if the tissue is there, the obstruction will persist and we haven't solved any problem. So we need to combine all, the, all of these procedures 
with, uh, with medical therapy. And medical therapy, uh, if it's effective in inducing reduction of the, of the perirenal tissue, as you can see in this case, this case has a huge perirenal infiltration. And after six months of therapy, uh, we, we saw about a 50% reduction in this, uh, in this tissue. But in most cases, this is not enough. And, and this is where we sometimes don't know what to do. And there are anecdotal reports in the literature where people have, all, have also been uh, treated surgically with a, with a surgery with, that is called ureterolysis, which is not uh, a debulking of the tissue. So we cannot get rid of all the tissue, but we can take the ureter, dissect it from the tissue, and put it in the, retro, in the peritoneum. It's called intraperitonealization of the ureter. So the ureter is not uh, in, a, in the original anatomical site and it cannot be infiltrated in. But this is very invasive, of course. What, is, what are the consequences of ureteral uh, obstruction in ECD? Of course, the kidneys can, uh, can, go, can, can fail suddenly. And this is what we call acute renal failure, but this is quite uncommon in patients with ECD, probably because the, 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 pro, the process itself is very insidious, it's, very, it's, it's slowly progressive. So what we have in most cases is a kind of chronic renal disease uh, of varying degrees, because we can have a serum creatinine, which is our marker for renal function, which is just slightly elevated, or we can have progression to end-stage renal disease. And nephrologists usually uh, say that you are in end-stage renal disease if, you, if your kidney function is totally uh, affected and, and you need to have a replacement therapy, which is dialysis or transplantation. In some cases, this obstruction also causes renal atrophy, because as in many organs, when an organ is affected, it becomes smaller, it shrinks. And this is what we see in some patients. In this patient, for instance, we see that this kidney is smaller than, than, than the other one, and it has some degree of atrophy. When the patients, in, in very few cases, basically uh, reach end-stage renal disease, we have different modalities to replace renal function, and these are hemodialysis, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And usually hemodialysis is preferred over peritoneal dialysis in patients with ECD, and if you want, we can go deeper into this. If we choose to go on to renal transplantation, there are no major contraindications to renal transplantation unless there are problems outside the kidney. But the problem is not only the ureters. As, as I said before, this tissue involves the whole structures that are in the retroperitoneum, so it also involves the vessels sometimes. And it can compress the renal arteries, and this process of compression of renal arteries causes uh, what we call renal vascular hypertension. And this is arterial hypertension, but this is particularly severe. Uh, of course, if you compress the, the arteries, uh, the, the, the flow of the blood to the kidneys is reduced, so the kidneys again can uh, develop atrophy, <coughs> chronic renal failure. This complication, which is often uh, overlooked in patients with ECD, uh, must be really searched for, and it can be easily diagnosed by angio CT, angio MRI, or with traditional angiography. When do we suspect that there is a, a, such a complication? When we have a worsening hypertension, when a patient that has always been normal tensive, normal arterial blood pressure becomes hypertensive all, all of a sudden, or when you have a chronic hypertension and it becomes and it worsens. In some cases, we need to escalate therapies of patients that are treated usually with just one drug. They require three or four drugs to control hypertension. We can also uh, suspect that there is uh, renal artery stenosis when there is asymmetry of the kidneys in imaging studies. So if one kidney is smaller than the other, then you need to suspect that there might be a reduced blood flow and then that there might be uh, renal artery stenosis. 
Then there are a number of serological abnormalities which are usually uh, a physician's affair. <laughs> and uh, these are uh, worsening renal function, the low levels of potassium, an increase in renin activity and aldosterone levels, and also metabolic alkalosis, which are yeah, very difficult to explain. And, but they, they are hints to a, a possible uh, renal vascular hypertension. What can we do again? We always try to be uh, as non-invasive as possible, and so we can do angioplasty, which is a technique that can be used in different sides of the body. It's usually used for coronary arteries, uh, and it, it's a, a technique that allows the dilation of the stenosis. But of course, in some cases, the stenosis is, is very tight, and we need to reinforce this dilation, otherwise the, the, the vessel becomes stenosed again, and we put stents uh, within, within the artery. But again, all of these procedures must be combined with medical therapy, otherwise we have no relief of the compression that we saw. Finally, there are other problems that can affect the, the urinary system, but they are not urinary diseases. Uh, one of them is diabetes insipidus. I probably, but the, the endocrine colleague uh, that will follow will explain it better. Uh, it occurs in about 20 to 25 percent of ECD patients. Its onset, who knows why, is usually years before the onset of systemic symptoms. Uh, it is due to infiltration of the hypothesis or of the tract between the hypothesis and the hypothalamus. And it causes low production of the uh, hormone that we call ADH, it's the anti hormone. So the kidneys do not really absorb water and what results is polyuria, that means a lot of urine, and polydipsia, which means that you're always thirsty. And this can cause also uh, what we call lutsu, it's lower urinary tract symptoms such as again frequency, urgency and so on. We can replace fluids, all the fluids that the kidney loses in the first phases, but we need to treat this condition with ADH analogs, such as <clears throat> desmopressin. The problem is that although the treatment can be effective for many um, different, for many complications of ECD, uh, most of the times diabetes insipidus uh, remains. And it's important to differentiate all these symptoms that derive from diabetes insipidus from those deriving from other complications, such as infections that can be treated, such as uh, urinary uh, tract irritation by stents, such as neurological complications that can affect your bladder function, and also uh, uh, known ECD related diseases, such as prostate hypertension. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, at this time, we're not going to be able to take any questions, but I always say that the speaker before lunch is one of the bravest of all, so this was wonderful. Thanks. Thank you very much.